So hi, everybody. Welcome. I can see some of you. Um, it's my really great pleasure to be here today with Lori Garrett. And um, Lori's known to most of you, I'm sure. Um, it's not very often we have Pulitzer Prize winners who come uh, and speak with us. Um, Lori is a veteran of the HIV wars, which is why I've known her for very many years. And she's been an incredible champion um, for public health and rationality and um, has often been able to say things um, in ways that get people stirred up and make them do things. And I really have appreciated her lifetime of dedication to trying to make the world a better place through her writing and her activism and her speeches. Um, she has been, um, let's see, you, you graduated um, from uh, Merrill College at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, and so now I know why you're there right now. Go banana slugs. <laughs> exactly. The, the even worse than the sage hens in terms of California or tridents in the case of uh, San Diego and uh, has a PhD in bacteriology and immunology from the University of California, Berkeley, um, where we are right now. And uh, she can remember the, um, our old digs and was, uh, was telling us that uh, this is a nice new building. <laughs> so it's, um, it's, I'm not gonna go through your whole background. Don't. Um, you've been at the Council on Foreign Relations, which has been a, a very important platform for you. And uh, I know they've very much appreciated that. And um, now, of course, like, any of us who are involved in global infectious diseases, you have been pulled into COVID. And um, I think like uh, many of us in this field are now worrying a lot about how we can do a better job at not repeating the catastrophe that we've just been through. And I think that's what you're gonna to talk to us about today. Um, I'm gonna to be monitoring the chat. And um, so feel free to post questions and stuff in the chat. And Laurie, if you want to go back to sharing your screen, the floor is yours. It's so great that you were able to be here with us today. Thank you. And this should be it. Here we go. Is there a way? Yes, I can focus on the screen. Great. So thanks so much for inviting me. Um, I'm in California. This is only the second trip I've made uh, in airplanes since COVID happened. Put that in perspective, in 2019, I was on five continents. I was on airplanes and or traveling more than I was at home in New York. And then COVID hits and it all stops. Um, the only, the longest distance flight was to Puerto Rico and now here. So it's a big deal that I've come to California, but I am a native Californian. You failed to mention that I'm a fifth generation oh. Los Angelino. Wow. And uh, from the point of view of public health, it's kind of interesting to think about this, that when my ancestors came to El Pueblo de Los Angeles as interloper immigrants speaking a foreign language, wow. right? Um, there were 22,000 people in what we now call LA County. Wow. So in five generations, we've gone from 22,000 to whatever the heck enormous number it is today. 12 million? Does that sound right? So what I'm going to do is take you through a really high speed, and I mean it, high speed PowerPoint. Um, pay close attention. Uh, and as you go along, if you have any questions, just pump them into the chat room, and we'll see if we can accommodate as many as possible as we go. So and why is it not responding? Is it not advancing? It is not. There we go. There we go. So to date, we've had more than 6 million deaths worldwide for COVID-19. Of those, more than a million have been Americans, residents of the United States of America. This is the, our most recent global snapshot of where we stand with the epidemic. We have to admit this is a total failure. This is an absolute complete failure with no end in sight. The case fatality rates, if we go back to 2020, show this wide variation, but it looked like an extraordinarily lethal disease. As Omicron appeared and we got more and more variants, the case fatality rate has come down remarkably to uh, about 1% or slightly below. 
But we have this huge long COVID crisis with more and more cases of poorly defined mixture of syndromes um, that even back in 2020, we could see were on the horizon. Uh, we already saw, for example, that there was carnage at, in in vitro analysis of this virus's impact on um, cells of the endothelial system, the cardiovascular system. And these are permanent uh, changes that are more pronounced the older you are, but that, that cause permanent damage to the heart. And the absence of nuclear material, cells are literally denucleated by the virus so that these are dead and never coming back. Cells of the heart, the cardiovascular system, um, and we've even seen it in such as this case way back in July 2020 of a German fellow who had no symptoms and no real COVID illness yet was infected and has suffered permanent damage um, as a result. And that was our first clue. We should have been paying attention that long COVID was going to be a crisis. Even a study of Big Ten college athletes showed huge drop in their ability to take in oxygen and pump it through their cardiovascular system effectively, um, possibly permanent damage. But certainly it was a, a sign that we were looking at something much more serious than, you know, do you die or do you survive? Similarly with the brain, we have this large British biobank study that involves thousands of people in the UK and compares them for various things in the brain. And we've done similar look in the Mayo Clinic. And again, these are all from 2020, showing clear shrinkage of gray matter, clear death of neurons, um, clear evidence that the brain is basically aging rapidly. And if you look at the brain scans of individuals who have even had asymptomatic COVID, may never have even been hospitalized, you can see that they suddenly have an aging old brain. In some cases, it's looking like the onset of dementia. Uh, we have memory loss and so-called brain fog and dizziness and the inability to uh, clearly understand your environment, the inability to have focus and intent attention, some palsy-like symptoms that almost look like the onset of Parkinson's. And, Tony Fauci was saying, look, this brain fog is something we're going to have to pay attention to. It was a new phenomenon. It defied clear medical analysis. But now I think we're, it's pretty clear that we're looking at perhaps 33 million Americans dealing with some level of brain fog and long COVID impact. This is going to obviously have an effect on our society long after we have the carnage in the streets from this virus. It's going to affect our bottom line, productivity, and how our economy recovers. Some of this, you know, people not going back to work is clearly people who have long COVID. So before the epidemic happened, just on the eve of it, we had a booming economy. We were finally recovering from the 2008 financial crisis. All indicators pointed to a soaring economy across the board, not just in the US. Most of Africa was seeing record GDP growth. Many of the poorest, previously poor countries of the world were, were cooking. Um, economies were overheating. There was actually worry that we would get some kind of inflation induced by this dramatic economy. Along comes COVID. Uh, and first, I need to show you because you may not realize how much GDP growth we were looking at in on the eve of COVID. The U.S. economy grew 2.3%, China 6.1%. And as I said, Sub-Saharan Africa was up 3.1%. Now we look at the International Monetary Fund uh, forecasts, and it is grim indeed. The whole global economy is slowing down. Perhaps next year only have a 2.7% growth of the entire global economy, which is of course very skewed. It means the rich countries grew well and the poor are really gasping. And inflation is soaring, perhaps 8.8% as we go towards the end of 2022 um, with continuing soaring inflation into all the way into 2024. And supply chains disrupted for absolutely everything and not restoring. So in JAMA, they had this uh, a prediction 
of what this economy, this whole impact was going to be. And they said it would be a $16 trillion pandemic. That may turn out to be an underestimate, but certainly the impacts on the global economy have been overwhelming. And a good part of the problem has been this sort of Sisyphean fight between so-called experts over, you know, how should we fight it? And clearly that's tied in with this rising political nationalism and the political divisions that have occurred all over the world. And it's not just America that is deeply divided. Um, we've seen globalization completely collapse and most of the supply chain trade aspects, but also globalization in spirit, globalization in shared ideas. And meanwhile, almost everywhere in the world, we're playing a game of whack-a-mole with new forms of virus appearing. And we're already in 2020, we were seeing countries say, you know, it began over there. That other country made it happen. That other place spawned this epidemic. The blame game started in the very beginning of the epidemic. So we've seen the lies. We've seen very poor mathematics as being held by the woman on the right here. Um, and we've seen uh, the rise of a kind of horror across the world in how we responded. So I want to take you to April 2020. In New York City, this is what I saw down the street from me. I had an 18-wheeler refrigerator truck holding cadavers just down the street from my apartment building. This is where we stood with the epidemic in April 2020, and the leading countries were Italy, South Korea, Spain, France, China, of course, which is not on this chart, uh, Germany, and just beginning Britain. We were still not really in the picture as a serious contender for the leaders in the pandemic. Um, and it was only a few days later that we start to get into a huge US presence in COVID. I was asked by Secretary General Antonio Guterres to address his executive council on April 3rd, 2020, and tell them where was this headed? What were we gonna do and how could we fight it? The executive council is the leadership of all the UN agencies. And uh, for the first time, the meeting had to be by Zoom because New York had just uh, a week and a half previously gone into lockdown. I noted that there were two forecasts, one put together by Hong Kong University, Gabriel Leung, and one put together by Imperial College. They both predicted that the majority of the planet would become infected and that we, if we maintained a case fatality rate of 1%, it could be 50 million deaths. I said, we have two options. We can either go option one, the rich world takes care of itself first and everybody else is on their own, or the scenario two, something unprecedented. We aim for either global eradication or elimination of human to human transmission for the whole planet. Here's how scenario one would play out. I predicted that the wealthy countries would practice social distancing and lockdowns um, to stave off the worst case scenario deaths but really it was about buying time until there was a vaccine. And it was a vaccine for them, of course, for the wealthy countries first. And that multiple countries would compete to develop a vaccine and patents would be issued. The patents would affect cost and availability for the whole planet. And that by the end of 2021, the wealthy world would have seen the beginnings of rollout financed by their insurance systems uh, but it would be well into 2022 that anybody beyond that would get access. And the virus I predicted would keep cycling around the planet over and over again, Southern hemisphere, Northern hemisphere, Southern hemisphere, Northern hemisphere. Um, we would prepare for one cycle, but the next cycle would already be looming and we would be ill prepared. I predicted that most of the poor world would go a very long time before having access to vaccine in any meaningful campaigns that could actually lower their overall social exposure. And that like HIV, SARS-CoV-2 would join the landscape permanently of infectious diseases that humanity faces from now until perpetuity. And this would result in a, another whole system of transferring wealth from the rich world to the poor to, for years to come, um, assist in COVID-19 responses in developing countries, much as we do now for TB, malaria, and HIV. 
and it would be an additive cost, another great burden for the UN system, for whatever side agencies were involved. Or I said, we could go plan B. And plan B would be that we're out to effectively vaccinate. Today, I would have to change this. We're now 8 billion officially, but 7.5 billion human beings on planet Earth in an all out global campaign in true global solidarity. This was my hope. And I stipulated that this would have several steps involved. It would have to involve China-US cooperation, which might sound impossible, but we did it in the 1960s and 70s when the US and the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War cooperated to eradicate smallpox and worked in sync, even as their countries as the governments were at war with one another. Smallpox eradication, of course, was easier to achieve because there were no animal hosts. It was easy to tell who was infected because of the poxing. And the, the vaccine left a scar so you could easily identify who had been vaccinated, who hadn't. The vaccine was incredibly effective. Um, nevertheless, it was done. So what would it take to make it possible to execute that scale of an effort in the world of the 21st century? I said, first and foremost, we needed a point of care diagnostic so we could tell rapidly and on site, like a litmus test, who is infected. And that included the possibility that there was a widespread asymptomatic infection. We now know better than 90% of all transmission is by people with no symptoms who are shedding virus. So we needed that and we needed a phone-based app to improve transparency. Um, to track information to and from public health authorities, plot immunization campaigns, and be readily available to all. No secrecy, total transparency, who's getting vaccine, who isn't. We needed authenticated vaccination data controlled by WHO or Gavi, the Global Alliance of Vaccinators, um, so that the whole world could watch as we defeated the virus. And it would be a collective uh, effort I mean, this is what I was advocating at the time. Um, we needed a full commitment to patent exclusion or TRIPS me mechanisms so that the poor countries could afford to make and distribute vaccine. As Bansky would put it, we have to put the eco of the world versus the ego of the centrist parts of the world. And we had to set the right goal of what we wanted in the way of a vaccine. So at this time, we were just starting to unfold the notion of Operation Warp Speed. And I said, look, it's got to be single dose. It doesn't need a cold chain. It's not involving needles. Um, we're we're going to go oral inhalation or dermal. It has to meet high safety standards. It has to actually block transmission and do so with 98% effectiveness or better. It has to be at an affordable price point. Let me just go back to complete this list. Um, there has to be an incentive fund created that was with Operation Warp Speed. Um, and there have to be immediate negotiations about the management of distribution and understanding how to do it transparently and without corruption and without preference based on the wealth of a nation. I also said we had to immediately jump in in a one health approach to find the source and the original reservoir of this virus and to tackle animal trafficking which was most likely where it came from, um, and shut down wet markets all over China, but also all over Southeast Asia, any place where the virus might lurk and might spread. We needed to consider microbiome analysis using um, metagenomic screening to as rapidly as possible identify whole of society um, trends in the virus's movement, which would mean wastewater uh, screening, and train up citizen scientists because it was going to take far more people than any graduate school had ever produced. <clears throat> so we, I hearkened to the environmental polio surveillance, which had turned up polio cases in places that had eradicated polio um, all over the world and the need to recognize that this was a system that worked. You could do it for a very tiny RNA virus and it was identifying um, otherwise unknown cases. So global access meant on-site pathogen and resistant genes identification and screening for everything about animal waste, 
human waste. Let's find it. And while we're at it, let's look for plasmids that might carry resistance genes to our medications. We had to see it as scaling up the production of products for worldwide distribution rather than making everything in the wealthy world, distributing it first to the wealthy world and then to the poorer world. And we had to consider all in advance before we rolled out vaccine, all the ethical, legal, legal and civil liberties issues and get ahead of any possible court challenges and legal disputes. Communications had to see that what we were trying to do was bring the whole world into global solidarity for victory over the virus. There had to be an aggressive communications campaign, get a hold of, get ahead of the trolls, get ahead of everybody, make it as transparent as possible, vaccine tracking to declare victory, negotiate with the major social media uh, platforms to take on a similar tone that we are as a world in solidarity against this pandemic and bring them into the campaign um, in support of mass vaccination and mass social efforts to lower the risk of transmission and get ahead by identifying the real social influencers who were possible sources of threat to this. The anti-vaxxer leaders, the anti-government leaders, bring them into the fold, negotiate with them, work with them before they take a public stance in opposition. Financing, I said, has got to be sustainable. It's going to take years. And I said, we need to revisit the Tobin tax, which was uh, first recommended by a British economist way back in 1972, putting a small levy, 0.05% on major financial transactions of well over $2 million. And this would reap fantastic benefits for a fund that could more than cover the costs of everything I'm describing so that it becomes a global burden, not a particular national burden. So I said, we have two options. We can go business as usual, all the same mistakes we've made in every other darn pandemic, especially HIV. Or we can go for a radical new way of approaching this and really bring the whole world in um, using the latest technologies to understand the movement of the virus, understand its action and tackle it with smart technology and access to all for all of humanity. And of course, you know what happened. It all fell apart right there in the room over the question of China-US cooperation. That killed it, full stop, end of story. And we went directly to a nationalistic response country by country, just because no one could figure out how to get the China-United States divide healed. So from the very beginning, we saw this huge differential in how strict that would be in the purple or lenient that would be in the pale blue. The guidelines were nation by nation. There was chaos, essentially. Every country made up its own response and made it up according to whoever were the loudest voices in the room. There were no, there's no real governance in the world of pathogens. There's no real governance over who controls planet Earth, its, its biology. We're in an Anthropocene where humans are the number one player on the planet and we have no governance. So I say we have to consider the notion of the democracy of the biome. How can we better understand what is going on at the microbiome level of our planet and make it an understanding that cuts across uh, social class, uh, geography, nationality to create a kind of new globalization 2.0. Uh, can we imagine a dipstick that allows you to understand and um, anticipate threats in the environment at the microbial level? What would that look like and how could we do this? To my mind, this is the only sort of hopeful thing we have. First, we have to understand what is normal in the microbiome and what are the major drivers of change in specific microecologies? Where, how fast is biodiversity and extinction um, destroying whole aspects of the microbiome of the planet in one ecosystem after another? That means we have to be racing to do this because climate change is pushing all this into extinction at an extraordinary pace. There is an effort to sequence the entire microbiome of the entire planet. Um, it's poorly funded, but it's aspirational. 
There's also a global virome project underway uh, to try and identify minimally all the viruses that can inhabit the human lung or the human pathogenic ecosphere. We have the sequencers, we have the devices. They're already in remarkable shape to be able to do highly accurate and incredibly cheap sequencing and the price point keeps coming down. So Herman Biggs studied under Robert Koch and he brought, he created the first city ever, New York City, to have a health department that was based on germ theory and where the activities and the uh, primary motivations of every single budget expenditure in the health department started with the microscope. The idea was if you know the germ and you could see its transmission from one human to another, you could take the appropriate social interventions to block that transmission and build your, your solutions based on monitoring efficacy with the microscope. I think 21st century public health has to be based on metagenomic testing and screening and a sense of getting ahead of the microbes. And just one quick anecdote uh, at the end, New York City, we now have metagenomic screening for polio. Uh, this is for wastewater screening of polio, uh, monkeypox, uh, COVID in all its variant forms and cryptic forms of COVID. And our, the information, the data is fed to our public hospital system, our Health and Hospitals Corporation. And they say it gives them a minimum two weeks lead time on whether or not they need to place additional orders for PPE, for get ventilators up, um, get patients out of ICU to clear space for expected flood of ICU patients. It's, a, it's working, it's a model. And I think all over the world, this technology is so cheap that we have to go in this direction and we have to do it fast. And I'll be happy to take your questions. We don't have a very large group. And um, um, so you can use the chat, but I also encourage people to raise their hand. Um, or I'll start <laughs> off because um, you, know, you talked about what we need to do to understand what the potential threats are. And later today, we're gonna see Gianna Mazet who led the USAID funded effort that was sort of the precursor to the Global Virome Project to characterize viruses and animals that that could become pathogens among people. Um, I've made the argument that it's rare for something to jump to a person and then immediately become an epidemic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much more common that the virus over time starts to be able to infect people but doesn't yet transmit from person to person. And at some point it starts to transmit from person to person. So rather than worrying about the viruses that are in the animals, what we should be worrying about is the fevers of unknown origin in people who are at high risk of being exposed to animal viruses and characterizing those because rather How than- How would that have helped you with COVID given that 90% of the transmission is by people who have no fever? No, I'm just talking, what I'm talking about is the very beginning, the early detection of the outbreak. Okay, but they had no fever. Well- I mean, in Wuhan, the people who had fevers and were violently ill in December 2019, were, as we know, just this tiny tip of the iceberg. And there were, you know, below them, hundreds of cases already infected uh, that were asymptomatic. It's just that China had no test and they weren't looking. Right, but I think that enough people are symptomatic that they would have been picked up significantly earlier. I'm assuming there were lots of cases before it was actually detected right. because there was enough concentration of people who were seriously ill. I think most of the time, enough people are symptomatic that you can pick up the symptomatic ones. Let's put it this way, looking for the, for the bug among symptomatic people is going to be much higher yield than looking for the bug among um, all animals on the planet. So it right? could be argued that by the time you're looking for the bug in symptomatic people, the horse is out of the barn. Could be. And we've shown a tremendous inability to respond appropriately when that horse gets out of the barn as a global community and as Americans. But, but I'm arguing that, that most of the time, there are multiple episodes over years of mm -hmm. the virus infecting one person, and therefore knowing that that's an animal virus that can infect people, 
rather than the viruses that can't yet infect people. Because the step is typically, first it becomes able to infect a person, and then it becomes able to be transmitted from person to person. Okay, Steph, let's do a little mind exercise. The year is 1975. We had somehow in 1975 this technology, and we're screening Kinshasa wastewater, Kampala wastewater, uh, wastewater in Nairobi, and so on. And we might have picked up HIV and might never have had HIV hit Americans become, quote unquote, the gay plague and all of that. We might have been able to anticipate and identify patients. I mean, there is a disease where that symptomology you're waiting for is an individual who's been infected for nine years already. So I'm Five completely agree with you. Because if you pick it up in the wastewater in Kinshasa or in, or in Entebbe, then that's already in people. That's right. different from going and sampling where the, where the chimpanzees and the howler monkeys But are. I'm talking about people. I'm right. talking about Fair wastewater. Fair enough. And, and, and here, here's the exciting thing. I mean, wastewater screening in San Diego, done by the folks at UCSD, Jack Gilbert and his gang, um, Rob Knight, and so on, has been able to identify cryptic strains that may in fact be only in one human being who's a cancer patient immunosuppressed or one HIV individual who's gone off meds or one individual whose immune system is stressed and they have a cryptic strain that has emerged. Now, wouldn't you rather know about that cryptic strain then than wait until it turns out to be one of the new strains that we're gonna give an acronym to and call it, you know, BQ.33.4, and it it's a total immune evasive and defies our vaccines. So Layla, you've got your hand up. Um, I, I, uh, I put it on, <laughs> the, the iPad was going back and forth, you on the camera, you on the screen and you in person. So, oh. so Layla, go ahead, please. Thanks. Um, Layla, I'm you're, you're, you're we don't hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I'm going to turn up the volume. Go ahead. <clears throat> uh, okay, Layla Klong, I'm an assistant professor in environmental sciences, and I really appreciate the comprehensiveness of your thinking and the way that you lay it out. And I'm wondering both how you learned that comprehensiveness. As we know, in higher education, you're encouraged to specialize, 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 and close your eyes to the other things about political economy and you know economics and culture. And so I'm wondering, how you came to that place of comprehensiveness and how you would encourage teaching that um, to our emerging public health professionals. Thank you for that. Well, certainly when I was a student here, grad student here, uh, comprehensiveness was discouraged. Focus in, focus in, focus in. The only thing you're supposed to look at is this one BT cell interaction <laughs> and um, identify how it can be seen with a fluorescence activated cell sorter. And that was, yeah, like, that's life. Um, but, you know, the first time I moved to Africa uh, and saw the scale of problems, I realized that I had to learn economics. I had to learn politics. I had to learn history. I had to learn uh, all sorts of public, what we now call public health. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think you uh, tackle any problem with a single knowledge base and siloing information is a pretty surefire way to, way to get the wrong answer. Uh, it's the, uh, people refer to it as <laughs> T-shaped education. Um, you go deep in something, but have the ability to, to go broad and I'm certainly convinced that so much innovation happens at that intersection of disciplines. And if you're not broad enough that you have that, you know, frisson at the border of disciplines, then you miss a lot of, of the potential innovation. I would just add one thing. I think one way to talk to students about how to approach education in a way that gives them the flexibility and the intellectual capacity to be um, fast on their feet and jumping from one set problem set to another is to have them understand that each discipline is actually a logic system. 
those in public health have a very different logic system from those in medicine. And when the two come to clash, it's often a bloody war, right? And in between at that clash point are the MD PhDs. <laughs> you know, um, if, you, if you come to the world through the logic sy system of medicine, your first and most important priority is to save the life of an individual. And if you come from public health, your first and most important point of logic is how do I save giant populations of people from a threat? And these lead to a set of systematic uh, learning and sort of analytical frameworks. And if you think of it that way, then you can see that political science is the same thing, um, that economics is the same thing. And then you can take a problem in the world, uh, you know, where did Donald Trump come from and how has he warped um, our national experiment in democracy? And you can begin to say, well, if I took the logic system and the toolkit of economics, here's how I see the saga of Donald Trump. If I take the logic system of public health, here's how I see a Donald Trump. And then you get down the road and say, well, then the, the solution sets are X, Y, and Z. And I think as a journalist, you have no choice. You, you have to be able to jump from physics one day to uh, you know, a, a scrappy local politics the next day and be able to understand how people reach those conclusions. Why would the city have voted to do this asinine thing? Ah, I see, the guy elected to run the city had a background in um, running a fish market. And so that's how he sees the world. So I see that at Pentoda, Former dean of ours um, came on camera, Ed, and uh, did you have a question? I do have a question. Hello, Lord. Long time, don't see. Hi. As you, you and I probably met in 1988 or so, Lori. Okay. And as you remember, we were working really hard on an HIV vaccine in 1988. That was now almost 40 years ago. So we still have no effective HIV vaccine. So, you know, one of your premises is that you, you set this very high bar for the criteria that you would accept as a successful vaccine. And it's still a, a very hard problem. Uh, and so, you know, is there, uh, is there an intermediate which would be useful in this context? The second question I have for you is, when would you pull the trigger on this massive effort? I mean, there are likely to be new viruses popping up almost daily around the world. So what would be, the trigger point that says, okay, the world have to undertake the Garrett uh, all hands approach to this problem. What, how would you go about thinking about that? how you'd start, when you'd start? So um, I would say that the COVID-19 vaccines that we have now are medicinal products. They're not public health products because they have no effect at all on transmission. And so therefore they are protecting individuals from hospitalization. You could stretch it to say it's public health because it's lowering costs uh, for health writ large by keeping people out of the hospital. Um, but basically medicine one, you know, score one for medicine. It's very likely, at least in the time scale of my imagination and my age that whatever we do come up with as an HIV vaccine will also be basically medicinal. That I, I don't see anything out there right now that looks like it could block transmission from one human to another. If that came aboard, then I would say vaccinate the planet now. Like, you know, activate this whole scenario, make it the, the goal of the entire UN system and declare it in the Security Council, if you don't have China blocking every declaration, and get out there and use it for the entire planet and we can end the HIV crisis. Um, concentrate on treating those that perhaps are so far gone that the vaccine cannot be effective in. But right now, I think we're probably gonna end up, if we do end up with a vaccine, it will be a medical vaccine that will somehow 
mean you could still get infected with HIV, but you're less likely to die of it. Um, and you can mount some kind of effective CD4 response. Who knows what that would look like? I can't, I don't know if you can, Steph, but I can't even imagine it biologically. But certainly many people are working, trying to make something like that happen. I mean, I would certainly like to believe that for both of these viruses, that if we did a better job with mucosal immunity, we could have a, a vaccine that was much more effective at preventing transmission um, rather than just preventing serious disease. Because I think well, that, you know, certainly with COVID, we've got a, you know, we can stimulate a pretty robust systemic immune response, but we don't block infection at the point of entry. You know, it also goes to, you know, Bernie Fields, the great uh, virologist uh, uh, that was at Harvard and wrote what was in its time, the standard text of virology, always said the fundamental mistake we made was not considering early enough and more aggressively enough, what is the route of entry? How does the microbe get into the human body in a way that effectively results in the disease process? I mean, I would argue that even with Ebola, we don't know the answer to that question. You know, we don't really know precisely how most people, there's the rare case where it's a needle stick injury or something, but, um, and HIV was amazing because we did know almost from the very beginning, we could see it was sexually transmitted. And we knew we had a tool and it was called the condom or today we have a tool and it's the, uh, the face condom, you know, and it, and it works, yeah. right? So why, um, why we limit ourselves in the way we think about these things, I just don't understand. And, and to your other question, writ large, when would you pull the plug? If we're not talking about HIV or COVID, we're talking about a theoretical microorganism in the future. I mean, I think you would, if you were to look at the Wuhan example, you would say pull the plug sometime January, February, 2020. If you're looking at, you know, it depends what the nature of your microorganism is. If we had something that jumped uh, again from a wet market or again from uh, like E. coli 0157 from the way we mass produce hamburger meat, um, you know, you have points of intervention where you might be able to stop the jumping, but it's already gone into humans and there's already human to human transmission. Then at that point, yeah pull that trigger. But it may not be exactly the scenario I laid out because of the nature of the microorganism and how it enters the human body. And so you need to know the answer to that and you need to figure that out fast. And you know, one of the things I didn't put in this PowerPoint, but it continues to mystify me, is why we didn't immediately set up smart cohorts for analysis of COVID. We, we should have had co cohorts set up, and I was advocating this uh, on television, and you could see it, you know, the recordings are out there. I was advocating it by mid-February 2020. We should have had a cohort in nursing homes, activated them across the nation to see if anybody's developing, even before we had a test, we certainly knew what the syndrome looked like. Um, we should have had cohorts in schools. Why shut down a whole school, set up a cohort and put in that cohort, you know, some sam sampling of parents, sampling of staff, sampling of kids from different ages. And they're agreeing to be monitored on a daily basis. And now, and then you know when you need to activate stricter control measures. But we, it's like, this is public health 101. We teach, everybody gets taught. How do you do a cohort analysis? It's like the first epi class, right? And yet, even now, we have almost no meaningful cohorts for monitoring the future of this pandemic. Well, I, one of the other lessons that's closely related, I think, is our abject failure at creating clinical trial cohorts. Yes. Um, because it's very likely, it happened this time, it's very likely the next time that a vaccine or a drug will be developed in a place which is, does not have high incidence and will need right. to be tested in a place with high incidence, right. right? So how crazy is it that we had all these different manufacturers, all these different developers scrambling to find their own individual cohorts in various places and that we don't have a coordinated global system 
that enables not only enables them to be tested in a more efficient way, but enables them to be tested head to head. So that you're testing different antigens in the case of a vaccine or different treatments in the case of a drug against common controls. Well, and I'll right. go a step further. How crazy was it that we just automatically assumed that we needed the cohort in Africa? Right. You know, when in fact it was Northern Italy that where everything was going out of control. And then it was, uh, you know, some part of Germany and then the UK repeatedly. Right. Yep. And New York City and, you and know, Mexico why, and Brazil. And, right. Yeah. Right. Why did we think, oh, you know, we have to set up a cohort in the middle of Zimbabwe. Right. Yeah. Oh, we have another. Oh, it says I have a chat, but. Uh, but I don't see it. Huh. Um, oh, Stephen, please go ahead. Come on camera if you can. Yeah. Here, so uh, it's Stephen Popper. I'm a lecturer in uh, infectious diseases and vaccinology. So, I, I mean, I think from a, you know, we're all in the area of public health. I think we all see the value in the things that you and Stefano have just been discussing. So given your wide experience, how do you build political will for some of this? Yeah, I mean, I, it's very hard to separate that the sort of front end of your question from how do we build scientific bridges with China? Um, I think the damage is absolutely staggering and contributing to that damage has been this false narrative about the virus having been made for malevolent intent reasons or accidentally as a result of gain of function research inside the Wuhan lab. Uh, and, and people said to me, well, why don't, why doesn't China just let America wander through that lab and go through their freezers and see what's there? And I'm like, when's the last time Merck let a bunch of Chinese people come in and go through all their freezers? When's the last time Fort Detrick allowed a whole bunch of foreigners to tromp through and go through all their records and, uh, check out what's in every single freezer and see if they're correctly labeled and on and on. I mean, this isn't, under the Biological Weapons Convention, we imagine a world that is the status of biology in 1955. Guess what? We didn't know a squat about, you know, Watson and Crick had just barely discovered DNA. Um, so here we are in the 21st century and our international diplomatic accords, uh, the accord that created WHO, that created PAHO, that created every institution other than the ones that are in the post HIV era. Um, they're all 20, mid 20th century institutions created when the world was essentially divided in half. One half was the Soviet Union and one was everybody else. And now we're in a world that just doesn't even begin to resemble that. And we don't have any system of global governance that's really working. I mean, the UN is, is essentially decapitated because Russia and China are permanent members of the Security Council and they automatically veto anything that really would put pressure on nations to comply with some sort of a mandate. So, you know, if Libya wants to slaughter refugees as they go across Libyan territory, uh, you know, China and Russia are going to veto attempts to stop that on the grounds that outsiders don't have a right to tell Libya what to do. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, there have been calls from China to, to literally investigate Fort Detrick because it's their counterpoint to our Wuhan lie. I think once that lie was out there, and now it just continues. I mean, it's it's now taken permutations that are just, you know, how many. Angels are on the head of a pin. Can you show me this one nucleotide? And did that nucleotide arise naturally or no? And was it inserted? And on, on, on. And now it's gotten to the point where so many scientific egos are engaged in the fight that it's no longer about what started it all, which was a China-US vitriol. And I don't see an end. I don't see an end to it. So. I think we're we're in deep shit. It's going to go on and on. Well, and what you said at the beginning about the level of effort required, the World Health Organization has a budget that's about half of Berkeley's. Yeah. 
So it's uh, just extraordinary to think that we, the organization that's responsible for leading an effort like that is so woefully underfunded. And so woefully intimidated. By, you, by all the people that you just mentioned. If you haven't seen it, I urge everybody to go on Google Images and um, just type in she and Tedros. And there is that famous moment when Tedros went to Beijing to try and essentially plead with China to be cooperative in the early stages of this epidemic. And he was placed at one end of this massive stage with Xi at the other end of this massive stage. They are so far apart. It's like symbolic of everything. And it, of course, immediately conjured that was rem I was reminded of that image when I saw Putin at one end of this massive table yes. uh, speaking to officials at the other end as he plotted the war with Ukraine. Well, Laurie, we've hit one o'clock. I am very grateful that you migrated up here. I'm very sorry that we weren't able to have a big in-person event and, um, and fellowship with our graduate students and others. I'm sure that the people who are here join me in thanking you and appreciating the talk. and. Um, it will be, it has been recorded and it will be made available um, to folks who weren't able to join us today in part because they're on the picket line um, uh, trying to get better wages for our, especially our graduate students. So Laurie, thank you very much. Thank you all for participating. Thank you, Lauren, for helping to organize and thank you, um, University of California Santa Cruz for bringing you up here. Yay. <laughs> really appreciate it. Bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye. I can't end it. No, I don't have to.